Our topic for today is we're skipping to or, or beginning with a new chapter nine, human sexuality in our book, uh, Theory and Practice of Universal Ethics. Hi. And Dr. Cowan. And, uh, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a very, very big topic. You know, for some, I think it's interesting in a lot of ways, it's a no brainer. It's something we all have a sensitivity to. And at the same time, it's also something we really don't. Uh, meaning to say that, um, well, I mean, just generally in society today, many people have the view that sexual conduct is, is not really a moral issue because you you know if you have two, as long as you have two consenting parties then what's the problem why you're not hurting anybody the other person is interested and so what's wrong with it I mean you know it's like do we we have a, a very uh, prude God who just makes people uh, doesn't want people to enjoy their lives and what's going on here you know so that I mean that's part of the, uh, it's one of the issues we face. And what I'm saying that I mean to say is that <clears throat> it's it's very deeply ingrained today that it's not very serious. Um, it doesn't have the seriousness of, of um, obviously it doesn't have the seriousness of murder, um, but it doesn't even have the seriousness of theft to many, many people. Uh, and it's not enshrined in law anymore. So that's another sign that in society, it's just not something that society is sensitive to, it's something that, that the community is outraged with. So that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin um, is that, interestingly enough, I think most people don't, despite that, still in their upbringing and in school uh, are brought up with a certain sense that there's something just not so, whether it's unclean or something lowly about being promiscuous, that there's something not dignified about behaving like that. Again, I'm, I'm talking now not in terms of Torah, but just in terms of our own experience, people's experiences as Americans. You know, it's nothing to do with religion per se, right at the moment. I'm just saying the way people just feel about it. They're, they're, they're just their instinctive sense of morality. That's what I'm talking about now. And that's what I'm saying is that from one perspective, I think that um, we're a lot less sensitive or a less, lot less um, shocked by such behavior. On the other hand, I think there is something in us in the way people are brought up or even in school that there's still something that there's something forbidden about it than the way people feel. It's certainly something maybe a feeling that there's something maybe more uh, um, very undignified about it, particularly for women. You know, and I think, again, also, this is, in other words, an idea, well, should I say the word, but what is it, slut, the word that people say? But in other words, I'm just talking about just the way people feel, the way um, which which historically must come from someplace. I mean, I, I, there's no question that it does it come from previous generations that had very different attitudes. Um, now in Judaism, the, the idea that there's this like specific emphasis on women's modesty over men's modesty doesn't, doesn't exist. Um, there's an equal amount of responsibility for both men and women to be modest. The idea that I think was more con was common I mean, not that I'm an expert, but in 19th century or in, in certain Christian societies that men just were apes and it was women, women's responsibility to, um, to, uh, to kind of control a man's sexuality or to protect family purity um, doesn't exist in Judaism. And... Um, the responsibility is on both parties to be modest, uh, to be, uh, and to keep uh, sexual unions within the marital unit. 
<clears throat> I mean, in best of circumstances, marriage should be something that happens at an early age. It's something also that, that very much conflicts with the way society now works. Is that, you know, it takes a long time for people to get through school, takes a long time for them to, to make a living, particularly takes a long time for them to make enough of a living to support a family. And that's very contrary, I think, to the way the Torah envisioned things. I also think it's very contrary to our natural inclination as, as human beings. It's kind of made a real mess of everything as, as young people are full of, full of sexual desire. And uh, basically, society is telling them, no, you shouldn't be married. So, so basically, there's a lot of promiscuity that, that ends up happening. Uh, and, um, you know, people are not getting married and having children um, at that time when it's really the, the, op the uh, optimum time for doing so. Um, obviously, it also creates this, you know, a very different view of what sexuality is. And if we take a step back about it, um, you just look at sexuality logically. I mean, I always say to myself, like, it's very interesting that somehow when it comes to sexuality, all of a sudden, all the Darwinian evolutionaries, evolutionists disappear, you know, because, you know, the, the, it is, what, what happened to all these people who are, you know, social Darwinists or who, um, you know, you know, believe in evolution as, as, as somehow being related to the meaning of life? Well, tell me what exactly evolutionary is the purpose of sexuality outside of reproduction. Um, I don't know, it's not like I've read all the books, but my point is simply what I'm trying to point out is on the one hand, society has this attitude of, you know, this emphasis on the, the ideas underpinning evolution. On the other hand, the very act that represents reproduction, which is really what evolution is all about, the power to fit it, the idea of, of, you know, species reproducing at a better rate and more successfully than others, and yet basically saying that, no, that's not what this, this act is for, this is for something else. On the other hand, on the other hand, there are different aspects of, of this, um, you know, relation of the, of the of, uh, physical relations other than just having children. Obviously, there are other aspects to it, very important aspects, in terms of the unification of the people involved, their intimacy and what leads them to that intimacy and what that intimacy is communicating to one person to the other. And also obviously the, yeah, the idea of that, of the people becoming a couple and, and having an intimate emotional relationship between the two of them and a physical relationship and so on. There's so many things in human being that are intertwined in um, in human sexuality. It's very highly complicated. Uh, it's probably above a, a rabbi's pay grade <laughs> to, uh, to really fully understand that, all that. But it's a very deep thing, which I think also is is the other side of it. Is it's clearly a very holy thing. And the point is, I mean, in the simplest of terms. Your pers the, the union of the two people are bringing down a human soul into the world. I mean, it's the greatest level of bringing in something, you know, some sanctity, something holy, and also really to a great extent fulfilling God's will, which is to, you know, bring holiness into the world and also to bring more human, uh, you know, more images of God into the world that they should fulfill their part and role in perfecting and refining this physical existence. So it's extremely, extremely important. And it, it's really, you know, extremely part of God's will that we get engaged in that endeavor of bringing children into the world. And um, I think that there's certainly philosophically, there's an idea of just using that just for personal pleasure is a kind of a perversion of, um, you know, that idea. I mean, you can put, look at it this way. You know, it's, I mean, there are there are mitzvahs, there are commandments we can enjoy. Some people really enjoy Torah study, for example. Torah study, in a certain sense, is also a form of, quote unquote, intercourse. I just mean intercourse in terms of the traditional old time meaning of the word, which is that, you know, it's a, it's, it's a communication relationship between two, meaning the, there's a union between the person and God. 
in Torah study. And, and it's often extremely sweet and enjoyable. And so there's an element of, you know, within doing a good deed, we can find, feel some great enjoyment. And um, so in a certain sense, maybe that also is taking place here with, with uh, you know, with the sexual union is that uh, there, there's, there's a pleasure, but that really the true place for that is in the fact that it's fulfilling, you know, Hashem's will and uh, bringing souls into the world and, and also unifying two different aspects of, of the human, the male and the female that are so different and yet bringing them together and finding some, a, some intimate unity between those two. And those are all sorts of beautiful ideas. Um, and so to pervert something that's really so special um, brings a person down very low. Um, or I should say it's, it's a great defilement of something that's very, very special, you know. Um, <clears throat> so... There's so many aspects to this. I mean, if we get back to the root again and the objective of, of Noahide is, is to make the world a settled place, um, you know, forbidden sexual acts do the opposite because they undermine human society. And this is really such a point that I find so interesting. Uh, well, not, not just so interesting, but really uh, the ignorance uh, of, um, I think, in, in, in a lot of, and the, and the kind of uh, disingenuous attitude that uh, modern society has about this behavior is that, oh, it doesn't hurt anyone. But we all know that isn't true. We all know that it does hurt people. It hurts not only the people who are involved because emotionally it's not really healthy for them, but it, it hurts society as a whole because of the breakdown in the family that it causes. And then after people get married and they have this habit of, being, you know, into, uh, you know, uh, having their sexual, having a lot of sexual excitement, there's a lot of uh, infidelity that also develops because of, you know, it's the idea that people that, you know, I, I mean, it may work for some people to be when people are younger, where they're promiscuous uh, in school, and then get married, you know, and settle down. But my tendency is to believe that there is an aspect that that you can't just change on a fly. You can't just change on a whim. And people at a young age are habituated to behave in that fashion for many, many years. And not everyone is like that, actually. I mean, I'm not going to say that that is, for, is everyone. But um, I think, um, or, or I'll put it, or I'll, I'll come at it from a different angle. Um, <clears throat> If the assumptions in our society is that a sexual desire is something that should be entertained and frustrating it is harmful to the person, again, that what happens is in that case is in a marriage, some, when sometimes things just don't go a person's way, because guess what? Things just don't always go every day the way we want them to in terms of uh, those matters or, or in certain, and many other matters, <laughs> many other of our wants and desires can't be met on a daily basis. We have to work with other people and, and, and their schedule or their life and so on and so forth. And we have to exert, uh, we have to have humility and exert self-control. And if we don't do that, what happens is we end up uh, breaking or at least weakening, if not breaking down our family unit, destroying children because in, as we see, uh, you know, we weak, it's, it weakens children terribly emotionally. I mean, we have now, you know, in, in Western society in the United States, an extremely high divorce rate. I don't know, was it 60% or more? In some communities, 70 to 80% uh, cho you know, of divorce rate and the children that are born out of, out of, out of wedlock or out of a two family, it's just the numbers are gigantic. I should have looked the statistics up because it's, it's extremely high. And, um, you know, there's no question in my mind that children are weaker as a result, emotionally. And um, they're also just weaker as a result that parents don't care enough about putting effort into their marriage. They don't care enough about putting effort into their children. You know, it's also part of it. The point is, is that what we see about sexuality is not just true about sexuality, but it's true about 
other things, efforts that need to be put into family, children, caring about family and caring about, particularly caring about children. I'm putting a lot of effort into children. In Jewish Orthodox society, particularly, there's an extreme emphasis on children. You know, it's there's so much about the children and about, you know, their schooling and having children and having, you know, as many children as you can, whether financially, emotionally, people having a lot of children. Um, and also, but just like life begins to revolve around children and their their upbringing and then and then their their life events their bar mitzvahs and you know their 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 circumcisions their marriages these are the happy events that that, that you know fam people look forward to um so i think that's that's diminished a great deal you know in other sort of communities and other parts and other part of the society and um, the idea, I mean, it's just common sense to think that this doesn't matter. I mean, so disingenuous. It, it's just, is so, you know, it's just, it's just, it's clearly just rationalization. It's only because people are lazy and selfish. People are just selfish, really. I mean, just, just say the truth. Look, I just want to enjoy my own life. Leave me alone. Don't say things like, oh, it's, you know, it's just not good for the planet to man children. Oh, stop it. You just don't want any because you don't want to put the effort. It's too hard. You see what your parents had to go through. You see that they had difficulties. You see what it meant, you know, financially, economically, emotionally, and the hard work. You just don't want to do it. Just say, it. I'm lazy. I'm selfish. I don't want to have anyone else. I just want take care of me. Say the truth. Stop the lying. Stop the pretend, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, idealization of, oh, it's for the planet. Yeah, sure. I don't believe any of it. <clears throat> I think we, we also have a problem with the fact that society as a whole is not helping marriage. It's not helping children. You know, um, I think that um, <clears throat> you know, the fact that both both uh, both adults in in a in a in a, in a, in a couple family unit, mother and father, have to work in order to have what's what's come to be accepted in American society as a norm, meaning to have uh, you know to own your home have a car and meaning with a middle class life has become something that really, I mean, I don't know what it is in Texas, but as far as in the Northeast here, uh, I think it's the same all over, but it's really impossible without both people working. And even then, I don't know if it's possible to have, particularly have more than maybe one child and to be able to afford it. I mean, that, that's, that's by design. I mean, meaning to say that it doesn't have to be that way, I don't think. I think that there is, you know, the, the, there are reasons why that's that way. And um, if, if the authorities and different institutions wanted things to be different in order to promote families, then things could be different. I'm not an economist, so I don't exactly, you know, know <clears throat> exactly know how, but I, I just, I, I don't call it an intuition, I guess. <clears throat> but I think things can be, could be different. I think, I mean, I think uh, certainly um, uh, we're kind of brought up believing that or or that it was a time in American history where things were different and, and one you know one person was able to work and the other person was able to stay home with the children and, and you were able to have, like I said, the house and car, et cetera. Um, there's also changes in values in terms of you know what people need. My wife uh, talks to me about this all the time. You know, 
used to be maybe that uh, you know women didn't uh, didn't go out for a manicure. You know, or there was a lot of things that people did at home. They just wasn't expected that that you went out and, and bought these things that everyone expects today. And just they just people just did it at home. You know, so why? Because it was in this, like I said, because the people had children and the, the money wasn't available, and and people just. In other words, what I'm saying is that the priority has to be the children first, and then. Have children first ask questions later. Uh, remember a story with, um, I mean, this is just such a common Orthodox Jewish value. But I remember my grandmother, may she rest in peace, um, was concerned about this topic in, uh, I guess, in the, in the, in the in 30s and 40s because um, they didn't have a lot of money. My grandfather, my father's father was a machinist or a tradesman of some kind. Um, I'm not even sure he started that yet, although I think he did. And um, so my my grandmother sent a letter to her grandfather in Jerusalem, who had emigrated from Russia, Ukraine to Jerusalem, didn't come to the United States. And he gave her, and she asked him, you know, you know, she voiced her concerns about having children, be able to afford raising children and so on. And he told her the answer that, you know, is uh, very much the answer that, uh, well, I also heard several times, you know, in speeches from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, which is that that is God's responsibility. You know, you have to have faith. You have, you have the children and God will provide the funds. Have the children don't provide the funds. Don't worry about it. And that was his answer. If you have the children and, and God, something will work out. Things will work out. I don't think that means that, you know, you don't have to get a job and or whatever, but the priority is to have the children and then you have to figure out how you have the children as opposed to, well, this is how much money I have. Do children fit into how much money I have? Obviously, the second approach is a lot easier on a person. In the first approach, the first approach could bring a lot of struggling with it. You know, again, this is just such a ripple of so many different ways of and in, 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 philosophically of how people think today, which you know really I think is wrong. You know, and I mean, just the idea itself, like it has to be balanced. Yes, we do have to have a peaceful life, but at the same time. You know, um, children and the family life uh, have to be have to have a priority. We have to go backwards, and we also have to know that effort and struggle is uh, is is a lot of what life's about. You know, and it's funny because people struggle a lot for their job. You know, and there's so much stress in jobs and this career and that career and corporate this and the next promotion. And it's a lot of stress, and it's like after it all. What 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 did I get out of it? Like you know, what was it really about? You know, one day, a person after 120, person goes into goes back into the ground. What did they leave in this world? How many years they worked for pharma for, for big pharma? I mean, it's really brainwashing. person leaves, you know, a family, they really leave like an eternity, like they, you know, people who think in the same morals that they do, and, and, and you know, there's like a continuity, you know, particularly in, in a Jewish mystical uh, understanding is that, you know, when a person has children and they continue to do the Torah and the commandments, um, the person continues to get merits from their activities in this world, because I mean, if they're following his teaching, his example, and his efforts, person may be not here, but he's still getting merits from, from the midst vote of his children and grandchildren and so on and so forth. That's incredible. But the point is that also, like I'm saying, the struggle that we put in for others, and obviously a person is you know, has to have time for themselves and has to have some downtime and everything like that. But nevertheless, pu pushing up the ante a little bit, you know, towards 
giving, giving, and that a person is a giver when they're in a marriage, when they have children, because it's not something they do for a few minutes and then they're back to themselves. It's 24-7. You know, when you're married, the person, other person is in your life all the time. So you always have to think about somebody else, not just sometimes. And a lot of times, some of the biggest things you're doing in your life has to do with someone else. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, so it's a completely different metamorphosis. You know, it changes a person then. Uh, on the other hand, casual sexual behavior is just the opposite. It's, it's using when people, well, people have a need, they seek out another person as the object for their need and then disappear. So it's the exact opposite of a marriage. There's also also deeper spiritual aspects, and that is that immorality and forbidden sexual unions bestialize the person, hedonize the person, and darken the person's you know spirit, or hide the person's spirit. Maybe I should say, you know, where they become much, much less spiritual and disconnected from the spiritual and from the divine and, and, and much more physical, uh, you know, like an animal. And um, if you look at Hasidic writings, there's so much of the, the way that the godly soul expresses himself is through the love and fear of God and thinking about Torah and the commandments. So when a person, you know, uh, gives into these things and inflames sexual desires and obsession, a person is constantly filled with thoughts and feelings and desires for forbidden behavior. So basically their animal part is dominant all the time. It's a terrible curse. And, um, you know, that darkens and, and that that's, uh, buries the soul under this, this weight of, the, of all that, you know, hedonism. It really distances a person from God. It's, it's really the, the, the mere opposite of closeness. And so it's extremely serious. And God, you know, how do I say, in a metaphorically sense or, or more so, God hates immorality. You know, Bilaam said that to, to the Midianites. How do we, how do we uh, attack these people? He said, well, the, the God of these hates sexual immorality. So seduce them into sexual immorality, and he's going to punish them. So we see the seriousness of this, of this area, and it's extremely serious. And it also says in our sages that someone who's careful in these, in these things is called holy. Someone who distances themselves from such conduct is called holy. A person can't be spiritual and, and uh, sexually... Um, is promiscuous and engage in forbidden sexual behavior at the same time. So, yeah, but we have a, we have a, a, a serious problem in society, which uh, again, the marriage is uh, not being properly supported, I believe. And again, back to the idea from the beginning is that um, it's not a personal matter because it affects, in fact, it's the most, I would say, it's the most national and communal issue, even more than, even to at least to the same extent, if not more, I think more than financial dealings. Financial dealings is not how you got brought up it's not who taught you. It's not, you know, it, it's not who weaned you. It, it's not, you know, not the first thing you learned when you were a baby. It's not who put your diapers on and your food. And, you know, it comes much later. It has to do with economic prosperity. We, we don't have an organized and um, faithful system of laws in terms of uh, business dealings, then things start to fall apart. In terms of uh, economics, it's not good. 
But that's not the only thing. That's not the only thing that society needs. Society's social fabric also can't be just let to, left to fall apart. And um, is that happening now? So the idea that these things are um, private is kind of, it seems nonsensical to me. It's not private because it affects everybody, the end. <clears throat> How do you regulate it in a, in a, you know, well, this isn't really a political, uh, <laughs> this isn't a political podcast, so it's not for me to say. What it is for me to say is that in relation to, to Noahide law, as I said before, to have, to have a settled society, morale, uh, sexual, uh, forbidden sexual unions and, 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 and the opposite of, of that, meaning proper sexual unions within a marriage is extremely important that we have a stable society and a moral society and a healthy society. It's most to be healthy. Healthy and stable, there should be stable um, units of family and extended family and communities. And uh, I think you see that also, like uh, I'm sure there are other societies have, but in the Orthodox society, it's one really positive thing that you do see like from a practical standpoint, families, extended families, and it gives people a lot of stability, I think. And then of course, communities. And it gives people a lot of stability, I think outside that's lacking. On the other hand, um, it also creates a certain amount of rigidity or conformity. But we have to understand that you can't have everything. And, and a lot of times we have, sacrifices have to be made. What's more important? You know, and but at the same time, we should we do have to also try to find the middle, meaning to say give people a little bit more uh, self, room for self-expression. But also there have to be some judgments and there has to be some understanding that there has to be some conformity. 